sunny autumn afternoon. Thanks for coming to the OIIP, the Austrian Institute for International Affairs. As a scientific director, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight, tonight's, I'm so used to saying tonight, <laughs> this afternoon's um, lecture on Europe and the exit from its neighborhood with Natalie Tocci from the Italian Institute of International Affairs and Tobias Schumacher from uh, Collège d'Europe. They will be introduced properly in a minute. Um, as the only independent think tank and research institute in international relations in Austria, we are celebrating 40 years this year of tirelessly working at the intersections of academic research, policy consultancy, and public outreach. And we're doing this in the areas of international security, political conflict and violence, po global politics of innovation, state and, tr and transformation of democracy, and very importantly for today, uh, on Europe and its neighborhood. And this event is part of our celebrations and it's also part of our efforts to raise the really big question of international relations today. And I think there is there are very few questions that are more on our minds right now than the future of the European Union. Uh, and this is occupying EU studies departments all across the world, basically. But we believe that we cannot make this analysis and not answer these if we don't look at the international context. We can not only look at the internal processes, the internal events of the EU, we have to look at how is the EU trying to find its role as a global actor. And of course, how it is interacting with its surrounding neighbors is one of the key issues in how it will find that role. Eventually, we hope that it does. Uh, and in the current political environment, there are various challenges to finding this role as well. And to the OIP, this is, this is an issue that goes to the heart of, of what we do here. Uh, we have regional expertise in Western Balkans, MENA region, Turkey, uh, and we have a whole research team just dedicated to um, looking into these issues. And one of them is Deputy Director Cengiz Günay, who will also introduce the guests in a minute. Thank you for putting this event together. Um, and since this, this is the last of our 40 year circle of events, I would like to also take this opportunity to thank our office managers, Daniela Herzl and Petra Boresa, for their extremely professional work in putting together a whole year of events. Thank you. Uh, and since it's a celebration of us as well, uh, we will now make you watch our anniversary video <laughs> so you get a better idea of what it is, who we are, what we do here, and then Cengiz will take over and introduce us.
why not? Um, is this on now? Do we need a mic or not? This one. Um, welcome, uh, also from my side, um, to this event, which is actually also an experiment. It's the first time we have such an event in the afternoon. And I think it turned out quite well. We can <laughs> do that more often. Usually, we do events in the evening. Um, today's event, as Saskia already mentioned, is part of our brand new, a brand new world question mark series um, um, at the occasion of our 40th anniversary. Um, and indeed, we feel like we are entering, or we're in the middle of a brand new world. And I think today, what we're going to do with these distinguished guests is to discuss about what does it actually mean for the European future of the European Union, and also, of course also for the future of, of Austria in, in terms of foreign policy making. Um, what does define this brand new world as we are trying to uh, name it is um, that probably most of the stable things we thought to know are kind of the feeling are falling apart. Um, it is a, a rule-based world with uh, multilateral <coughs> institutions playing a central role in the in the um, in, 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 in major decision making at least, and uh, different states coming together and trying to find a common solution to certain <coughs> problems and crises. I mean, this is of course also an idealized uh, version, probably, of the world of the liberal world order, as we as we call it. Um, but we, we pretty much feel that it is somehow falling apart, and it's not as it used to be. Um, Today, it's uh, the uh, also 15th anniversary of the, not today, but this year is the 15th anniversary of the, um, uh, uh, that, uh, that the um, uh, European neighborhood policy was launched, first uh, in regard to Eastern Europe, and then it was extended a year later to, to Southern European, to the Southern European neighborhood. And the question is, 15 years after, are we, we face a completely different Europe, but also a different neighborhood, so to say. Um, just to call a, a, a couple of examples, we are discussing uh, very heatedly Brexit, uh, which is a huge, uh, which will, has a huge effect already on the EU and its self-understanding. Um, inside the EU, it's also the rise of nationalism and populism that is really threatening the European project and national interest standing in the way of the common uh, foreign policy and the common neighborhood policy. And in the neighborhood itself, um, we have had uh, developments such as uh, the Arab uprisings, which have completely changed uh, the geography, not the geography probably, but the, 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 um, the understanding of state and statehood in the southern uh, neighborhood. Um, and we had uh, um, the Ukrainian crisis at Europe's doors. We have uh, Syria, which is a burning uh, example of, of a lot of crises taking place around Europe. So instead of a, a, a zone and circle of stability that the European neighborhood policy tried to create, we can talk of a zone of crisis and instability stability surrounding Europe. Um, um, having said that, and this is, I think, the, the point we should start our discussion, is a common neighborhood policy still something um, that is possible anyways? And I will ask the two panelists um, to give short introductory remarks, and then I will ask some questions, and then we open the floor, uh, because you might also have some questions. Let me start with Natalie. Um, Natalie is... Um, a graduate from Oxford and LSE, and she is currently the director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Rome. She is honorary professor at the University of Tübingen and special advisor to EU uh, higher Repre representative Federica Mo Mogherini. Um, she also wrote the European Global Strategy, and she is now working on its implementation in the field of security and defense. Um, I could go on with a lot of uh, yeah. positions you also <laughs> held. Uh, I'll cut it short. Um, uh, Tobias Schumacher is professor um, and uh, he's holder of the chair in European Neighborhood Policy at the College uh, of Europe, Natalin Campus in Warsaw. And he is permanent visiting professor uh, at Sciences Po in uh, Paris. And um, um, he has also lots of publications just as, as uh, Natalie. And he is also the, um, uh, the uh, editor of uh, a profile 
uh, articles at a European uh, politics journal. Um, <clears throat> well, let me start with you, Natalie. Um, what do you think? Is there still a chance for a common European foreign and neighborhood policy? Um, okay, so let me be... Um, I'm not known for my diplomatic skills, uh, <laughs> and I would live up to that expectation. <laughs> uh, I would say not only that, there, um, that the European neighborhood policy is obsolete, I would say that it has been obsolete, uh, at least if one wants to be generous, for the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, you cited, um, Genghis, the, um, you know, the, the, the fact that there had been this expectation of this ring of well-governed countries, etc., etc. Well, we know that at the very least, if we look south, uh, this expectation has been, this vision uh, has been shattered uh, over the course of the last seven years. Uh, and if we look east, it has been uh, well, seven years, meaning after um, the Arab uprisings um, that obviously initially offered a lot of hope uh, ended up um, turning into a very long, drawn-out period of authoritarian retrenchment, uh, civil war, regional rivalry, global competition, I mean, you know, you name it. And this has been going on, as I said, now for already uh, seven years. Uh, if we look east, we may give it a little bit uh, more time, meaning that things started going on a little bit later, but at least since 2014, uh, you know, again, being very, very naive about this, uh, we, at least since then we can no longer deny that uh, the European security structure and architecture has been very seriously questioned, uh, that in fact not only does uh, Russia uh, interfere, as it had done for decades in the countries of the Southern Caucasus, in Moldova. Uh, not only did it, after 2014, annex Crimea, destabilize Donbass, but it has even stopped there. Huh? So it's gone all the way through to trying to interfere uh, into domestic uh, processes uh, and information slash, slash disinformation across the European uh, continent and in the, in the United States as well. So at least... Uh, for the last, you know, more than five years. So, if we take the period of the uh, sort of co outgoing commission, at least, uh, even if we just go back to the beginning of that, so five years ago, uh, that was the moment to say, well, the European neighbourhood policy is dead. Uh, but, but, uh, sorry, no. There's a third very uh, important thing that, uh, again, we've uh, known at least for, uh, you know, sort of the last five years, if not a decade, is that what was uh, understood as being the overall international context within which the European neighborhood policy was configured, which to me was very much a context, a sort of post-Cold War context of US hegemony, uh, within which the European Union embedded itself, and above all embedded its um, expansionist uh, mode. Uh, in a sense, we were living at a time not only of EU expansion, but of NATO expansion. We were living at a time in which we thought that there was, we were living in the end of history. Mm -hmm. There was, uh, everyone sooner or later was going to get to the promised land. Uh, some sooner, some later. Uh, even Russia would at some point not enter the European Union, but uh, somehow be, be infected, positively infected by the liberal uh, international laws that Jenkins that you were referring to. Now, again, that world is gone, and it has gone not now, uh, it has gone already for a number of years. But why is it that for the last five years there hasn't been uh, the, the kind of shift uh, that in response to these pretty uh, sort of, I mean, this the, the tectonic shift of, uh, of the place? Um, I think sort of one side of it uh, has to do with institutional inertia. I think it's really as simple as that. 
um, you know, never underestimate the conservative instinct <laughs> of, uh, of, of institutions, of, of political actors, I would say, in general. Um, you know, and, and, and there are obviously good and bad sides to this. I mean, it is true that you don't want to get rid of a framework up until when you have an alternative framework that is as persuasive. And precisely because we are in this process uh, of, of transition, meaning that we haven't yet reached a new steady state of where the EU is not only at home but also in the world, it is difficult to imagine a new fixed, uh, rather rigid institutional framework that somehow captures what is it that we should be doing uh, both at home and in our surrounding regions. Uh, note that I don't use the term neighborhood. Um, <laughs> But I do think, you know, again, to sort of see the, uh, the, the glass half full and then the half empty one that we still have to fill. Uh, I think that if we look back at the last five years, there are a number of things that have started changing. Uh, I think at the very least intellectually, uh, it is not just the kind of people in this room, but also the kind of people within the institutions that get it. Hmm? Get it. They may not still have uh, the necessary uh, will, capability, stamina to do it, but they get it. Uh, and, and I do think that there are a number of things that, as I said, st have, have started changing. Uh, I think one thing that has really started changing is a far uh, greater focus than at any other point in history uh, of the European Union to focus on, on security and defense. Uh, and, and this is, you know, I appreciate that uh, to those that are less attuned into the EU acronym SOUP uh, may look at to this uh, as sounding quite bizarre, but for a union that has struggled, it, you know, over the course of decades to make even the tiniest step forward on defence, the fact that, to give perhaps the most obvious example, the European Commission that used to consider defense a dirty word actually promises to put 30 billion uh, into this in the next multi-annual financial framework is, is big. And it's not out of you know the fact that whatever, the European <coughs> Union has decided to toughen up because it's nice to do so. It is very much linked to the point that I was making earlier, and in particular, not only this imploding neighborhood, um, but above all, I would say, the question mark, at the very least, that the United States will remain, not necessarily today, so I would detach this point from uh, the fact that there's a gentleman called Donald Trump that is president of the United States, but I, I think this is a structural point. We simply cannot know that the United States will be there in future to look after us. Uh, and the very fact that there is a question mark that has never existed in the history of European integration uh, has meant that there has been this slow, perhaps, perhaps too slow, but I think still significant process of, uh, of waking up. The second point, which goes more directly to the point about what do we do outside uh, the EU's borders, uh, has to do with the fact that we are beginning, we may not still be there, but I think we're beginning to try and understand what do we mean by a policy towards our neighbors or our surrounding regions uh, that is a foreign policy? Uh, it is not an integration light policy, which doesn't mean to say that you have to discard the integration light elements uh, to it, but it means that you cannot limit yourself to having an enlargement light or an integration light uh, policy. So when you have concepts, for instance, and you cite the global strategy, like resilience or the integrated approach to conflicts and crises, these are foreign policy concepts uh, and, and, and goals and, uh, and methods of work, if you like, um, that are EU-like, hmm, because we are talking about the European Union, meaning that, for instance, if you take the integrated approach or resilience, both, uh, it is very much about uh, a joined up approach to foreign policy making, so using your more traditional instruments of foreign policy like defense or development or diplomacy, alongside what you may do on research, infrastructure, migration, I mean, energy, climate, I mean, using all the external aspects also of your internal policies, 
further goals of resilience building or an integrated approach to conflicts and crises, but it is an attempt at developing a foreign policy uh, alongside uh, 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 an integration light, if you like, policy. And then the third point, which is probably the most uh, difficult of all, is this uh, question of how not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, there was a very strong normative underpinning, uh, you know, sort of hypocritical and uh, Eurocentric and whatever you may like, but there was a normative underpinning behind the neighborhood policy. It was intended to be, uh, at least on paper, transformative in nature. How do we develop a foreign policy uh, that does not discard that normative agenda completely, which does not reduce itself to crude realpolitik, even if it's a foreign policy? Uh, now, it's not, uh, uh, you know, the answer is not obvious. Uh, and it is a question of, yeah, I mean, sort of uh, balancing different goals, different objectives, uh, using different methods and different instruments. Um, but there, I think that uh, at the very least, uh, what we have to ensure we do, and here I'm sort of making the transition to the last set of things that I wanted to say, uh, is make sure that we get it right in the one region which is not in the neighborhood policy, enlargement policy, uh, but where we simply cannot afford to get it wrong, and that is the Western Balkans. Uh, and I think it's, it's important to <coughs> make this point now, after what I personally consider to be a huge strategic blunder that the European uh, Council made um, only a few uh, days ago. Uh, I think this has been... Um, in, I don't know whether it's too late or not, but I mean, in regard to North with Macedonia. regards to not opening accession negotiations with uh, North Macedonia and Albania, uh, I think uh, at the very least the question of uh, North Macedonia, I mean North Macedonia, uh, I mean I simply cannot think of one good argument uh, okay. <laughs> not to have done it. Uh, and, um, and, and look, you know, this is not a region that is uh, as any place simply staying still. Uh, things are happening in many parts of that region. Things are not actually going in the right direction, and we have fewer things not going in the right direction. Uh, and the few good things that are going in the right direction, uh, we risk reversing. I mean, you know, the fact that um, the North, uh, uh, that, that Zoran Zayev has resigned and has called for snap elections, and uh, who knows uh, what will happen as a result of those. You know, the idea that not only, so it's not only the European Union not supporting um, positive transformation, but it's the European Union that risks actively, not passively, actively supporting a negative uh, transformation. Uh, so I really do think that it's absolutely fundamental to get this right. At the same time, I do think that it's absolutely fundamental to take what is good behind the um, caution and skepticism of the skeptics. Uh, I think it is a real issue that once you're in the European Union, uh, you can pretty much do what you want uh, and not pay any consequences uh, and any costs for that. Uh, I do think that that's something that has to be fundamentally revised, which does not mean necessarily revising the enlargement policy, it means revising the European Union itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that is, and obviously here what I'm referring to is Hungary and Poland, and what I'm referring to in terms of uh, internal EU policy are the rules that govern in particular the multi-annual financial framework. Uh, a second point that I think uh, is essential that we do is actually deliver on defence. Uh, we, again, all the mechanisms, all the instruments are in place. Uh, we don't need to produce more paper on this. Uh, we need to do it. Uh, and even in the best of circumstances in which we start doing it now, it will take about 20 or 30 years to actually get it done, which means we need to do a start now because we don't have the luxury of, of, of sitting and waiting again in a world in which uh, the United States is very clearly in what I consider to be its post-imperial phase. Uh, and what I mean by post-imperial is that we have a United States that simply no longer has the ability, in the case of Trump, not even the willingness, to sustain an international system larger than itself. Uh, it's simply not in that frame of mind anymore. Mm. And it cannot 
afford to do it uh, anymore. So where, so you know, the U.S. is exiting the Middle East. Uh, it will exit Europe. Its big strategic challenge, if it manages to meet that, is China. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing to do with our neighborhood, uh, and that is something structural uh, that we have to that we have to live with. Uh, and then, and this is the my very last thing that I will say in terms of uh, of what to do, is the idea that unlike. Uh, the United States, we don't have that option of exiting anywhere. Uh, meaning, yes, we may have an option option not to be uh, particularly, whatever, assertive on uh, East Asia, but we don't have an option of exiting uh, our surrounding regions precisely because they are our surrounding regions. They are our region, our collective region. Now, the difficulty with this is living uh, with, on the one hand, this reality, and on the other, the other reality, which is the fact that we don't have a magic wand. Uh, we cannot fix, unless anyone had any other ideas, we cannot fix the Syria conflict. Uh, we cannot uh, ensure that ter whatever Turkey, uh, or Egypt for that matter, becomes a shining democracy. Uh, we don't have that kind of power. And it's kind of li living with those two realities. You know, the fact that you have to be there, you know, so you have to be... Um, strategically reliable uh, and present and, and coherent, but you need to both explain to yourself, and in particular to your public opinion, um, and to have a credible policy outside that is not premised on the illusion that we, we can solve all problems. Uh, we can't. Uh, we're lucky enough if we can solve our own internally, and even that's a, bit, a big challenge. Um, and again, it's a very different frame of mind from that of how the neighborhood policy was originally conceived that was very much the idea that here comes the European Union and it does have that magic wand to solve problems if only you do as it says. Um, we're just simply not in that world anymore. Uh, I do think that it is possible to have, uh, you know, both in terms of strategy and in terms of action, uh, a policy that makes sense, but it's a long haul policy. Uh, it's not one that delivers a uh, solution in Syria today or, or, or tomorrow. But as I said, that's simply where we are. So our neighbors are not going away, our surrounding regions are not going away, so we still called upon to have a credible policy towards uh, these areas. Um, but it has to be not a realist, but a realistic mm -hmm. uh, policy moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, um, so. Um, before giving over to, uh, to Tobias, um, let me sum up. I think um, that um, one of the things you said, you said many things I could uh, refer to, but um, that Europe just doesn't have a chance to get away from its region and it has to get involved with that region somehow because otherwise others will fill the vacuum and it has already started. I mean, you see in Northern Africa, a lot of uh, regional and global actors be becoming more and more active. You have the same in, in the Eastern so-called neighborhood. Um, and even in countries that are um, candidates to EU membership, you see a growing influence of outside actors such as Russia, Turkey, and others getting more and more active. So well, what's, uh, is there any, I mean, it's, we, we have painted a quite dark picture. What is the way out of this? Tobias. <laughs> I guess that is the uh, one million dollar question, Julius. Um, I'll come back to it in a second. Um, but first of all, um, allow me also to say thank you to you and, and, and your colleagues here at uh, the Austrian Institute, not only for participating in this particular panel debate, but in fact for having been invited to join the party <laughs> and uh, celebrate with you the 40th anniversary. Um, happy birthday um, on that yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I recall I have been here, I think the last time was 10 years ago or 11 years ago, and that was also in the context of some uh, birthday celebrations. Um, so the very fact that I have been invited yet again after some 10, 11 years <laughs> seems to indicate that I'm being regarded as uh, someone that you know um, is uh, qualifies for a good party or at least can contribute to the party. Um, let's see what you will feel um, after this panel and whether I'll be invited for the 50th anniversary. Um, before I, I come back to the, the point that you just brought up, uh, Cengiz, um, allow me to also um, address um, some of the points that, that Natalie um, very aptly already um, touched upon, um, and in particular um, engage with this very title um, of this, this very panel debate this very afternoon. Um, as to some extent, I think it, it captures and embodies uh, 
to some extent at least um, the debate that, or parts of the debate that we have been pursuing over the past 15 years. Um, Europe's exit from its neighborhood. Um, to me at least, and, and forgive me for, again, um, maybe not being that good a, um, a guest to this party, um, 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 striking a more critical chord, um, as, as this particular title seems to imply a number of things. First, that Europe, whatever that is, and its neighborhoods, whatever that is, um, are two distinct spaces. Mm -hmm. I, I find this very problematic, a starting point, um, for a number of reasons. Um, a, parts of the neighborhoods, or if you wish, surrounding regions, as Natalie prefers to call it, and I very much agree, in fact, with this term, given that the entire idea of labeling the neighborhood neighborhood is a very artificial one, um, as some do, in fact, qualify as neighbors, while others that, in fact, would also qualify as neighbors um, were never put in, into the same category, and yet others that do not even share any land or sea border or air border with the EU are also being considered neighbors, and so on and so forth, whatever. Um, it, it seems to imply that the European Union is in fact representing Europe, and that anyone that is not part of the European Union is not even European. And I find this problematic. I find it problematic because it reinforces this, this self versus the other dichotomy, us versus them, um, and to some extent it even reinforces the image that a large number of <coughs> fact factions of societies in parts of the surrounding regions nowadays have, namely that the European Union is a patronizing and to some extent even neo-colonial power that is imposing on the uncivilized or non-civilized other its policies, its norms, its values, which allegedly, supposedly, are even superior. Mm -hmm. That is problematic, and this has serious connotations and repercussions on how the EU is being perceived, um, as mentioned. Secondly, linked to that, of course, you only need to look into who is part of this European neighborhood policy. And you will then immediately realize that you do have, in fact, a large number of countries that are truly European, um, who regard themselves as truly European, but just because they happen to be on the other side of, of the Iron Curtain at some point, um, and were not as lucky um, as some others in the early 90s to have become part of the enlargement um, track at the time, are now even being regarded as supposedly non-European. At the same time, the association agreements that the European Union has put in place with countries such as Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, Moldova even stipulates that these are European countries. In the case of Georgia, it says Eastern European country. That's a very fine difference. Um, and acknowledge the European aspiration of these countries. So to speak of Europe's exit from its neighborhood, I think, needs a rethink um, precisely um, for the, the, the reasons I just um, mentioned. The second point that this title implies is that Europe is exiting. And that in turn seems to imply that Europe has been present mm -hmm. um, in its surrounding regions. And if, if I were to pick up on what Natalie said, well, then I think we have to acknowledge that in a large number of the European Union's surrounding regions, Europe has not been present, neither physically nor materially, nor how would I want to say, from, from a socialization perspective to the extent that it was capable of shaping the perceptions of others as to what is right, quote unquote, and what is wrong. What are the norms that we stand for and that we want you to, um, in fact, also internalize. Now, at the same time, I'm somewhat hesitant to, to buy that. Um, and I think that... that the title and, and the assessment that the European Union has not been particularly present or visible in its neighborhoods needs to be qualified. I think it really depends on the country at stake. It depends on the policy field and the issue area that we talk about. And again, if I were to start looking at, say, a country such as Ukraine, Moldova, or Georgia, Georgia in particular, but also Ukraine in particular, I would say, well, 
This is a surrounding, I wouldn't even want to use the term region, I, because I think even that is debatable. Well, this is a space where the European Union has, up until now, at least to some extent, made a difference, where it truly matters. Had it not been for the European Union, Ukraine would have gone bust, would have been bankrupt already. Had it not been for the European Union, mm, the Georgians would not have engaged in a process where they transform their entire regulatory system, where they in fact adopt or approximate with, I have to be more careful, where they approximate with, not necessarily adopt, and that's a different matter, but where they approximate with EU laws and standards in the field of competition policies, in the field of the service sector, sanitary, phytosanitary standards, trade, labor market standards even. So in that sense, the European Union has been, to some extent at least, to a limited extent, a transformative power, influencing even, I would say, how um, decision makers, how civil society in a country such as Georgia in particular, um, nowadays, or for the past 11 years, maybe even a little longer, um, look at the world and um, which foreign policy um, premise, uh, objectives um, should be pursued. Um, even in the southern neighborhood, arguably, I mean, the, the space where, where usually all of us tend to engage in EU bashing, I would say a, a more nuanced approach is very much needed. Um, think of Libya for in instance, um, where all too often observers tend to say, well, but the European Union hasn't really made a difference, it's completely clueless, it's powerless, in light of the many external actors that are nowadays engaged there, such as the Qataris, um, the Egyptians, the Turks, um, the Emiratis in particular, um, you name it. And yet I would say, well, even there, the European Union does make a difference to some extent. Had it not been for the EU, for instance, the whole LPA, the Libyan political agreement, had never been brokered, arguably at least. Um, the, the liaison and, and planning cell that, that the European Union has put in place is providing the international community, is providing the UN with valuable intelligence and, and information. Um, the extent to which the European Union is engaging civil society, admittedly to the extent that it exists in Libya, um, is unprecedented in comparison to other external actors. Um, the extent to which the European Union has investing itself in um, um, healthcare and, and social security uh, sectors in Libya, um, that is unique. Um, it's arguably the only um, external actor that is doing that, and so on and so forth. And I think I could come up with a number of other examples, and of course distinct policy fields and issue areas, where the European Union does matter. Now, this brings me to the second point, um, a point that was also touched upon by, by Natalie already. Um, and I think this is a point that is important um, because depending on the perspective that you eventually take, you reach very different conclusions. And my, the point I'm trying to make is, what are we actually talking about? We all seem to have an idea as to what this ENP is about, and yet, over the past 15 years, ever since I have been working on this, or at least ever since it has been called European Neighborhood Policy, um, I came to realize that there are numerous and rather divergent interpretations of what, in fact, this ENP truly is about. Now, the pragmatic answer, the obvious answer, the obvious answer, let me start with that one, the obvious answer probably is, well, the ENP is a policy framework, it's not a policy, it's a framework, right? That's already a major difference. It's a policy framework whereby the European Union is trying to externalize parts of its internal agenda, where it is trying to bring together elements of cooperation with elements of integration, at least as far as Eastern neighbors are concerned. It hasn't been particularly successful in that regard in the South. Um, and um, to contribute to economic modernization and to some extent even political transformation. Now that's the obvious answer. The more pragmatic answer probably is, well, it's a vehicle. It's a foreign policy tool of the member states um, to pursue their own, maybe to upload their own foreign policy objectives, their economic interests, their trade interests, 
um, their security related um, objectives, you name it. Um, to upload them, to use the ENP as, as a platform to pursue these objectives, precisely because the understanding is that this can be done in a better way um, by drawing on EU resources, while other member states regard it as a nuisance, as a bit of a, well, necessary thing that you simply have to participate in and where good participation or participation ship, I know that term doesn't exist, but yet I like it, um, might pay off um, on another day on a different occasion, right? So tit for tat. Okay, so that's, that's the pragmatic or, say, realism-inspired um, perspective on things. And then you have the academic answer, which would be, well, the European Union's neighborhood policy is all about external governance. The European Union trying to transpose its, its norms, its values, its rules and regulations, um, and thereby also trying to blur the borders and boundaries between the self and the other. But I'm not speaking about territorial borders, I'm speaking about sector-specific borders. And by blurring these borders, it is even creating a buffer zone between the civilized self and the alleged uncivilized um, others. So from my perspective as an observer, I would say all these perspectives are correct and the pundits, the respective pundits do have a point. However, why this is so problematic is because depending on your starting point, depending on how you look at what this neighborhood policy is about, you reach very different conclusions as to whether it is a success or a failure. But clearly, and this brings me back to, to your initial question, Schengis, um, forgive me for being a little bit uh, exhaustive here, um, what the European Union's neighborhood policy has been suffering from, literally from the very beginning, is that institutions and the member states alike, uh, alike fail to come up with a clear objective as to what this framework is truly supposed to be about. Is this about contributing, contributing to peace, prosperity, and stability, as it said initially in the wider Europe, doc uh, Europe document of March 2003? Is this about creating a ring of friends, as Romano Prodi put it in 2003? And what do we mean by friends? And can we actually, in fact, we as a European Union generate such a ring of friends, given that the extent to which we are attractive as a potential friend to our surrounding regions depends very much on whether they want to become friends with us and what they mean by being friends. Um, is this about um, expanding our sphere of influence, um, the, the neo-colonial, neo-imperial um, kind of argument? Um, is this about connecting societies, something which, again, if we are to talk about successes and failures, is something I think that is happening in the eastern part of Europe as a result of the eastern partnership, um, I would say. Um, but all in all, it's very much about is the ENP a means to an end or is it the end itself? And in that sense, my, my final argument, I believe, is unless the European Union is capable of hammering out what shall be the end goal of whatever policy framework we eventually may have in place. We don't have to call it neighborhood policy um, because de facto, as I said, it's a framework and not a policy as such. The extent to which the European Union can be an effective actor, I wouldn't even want to use the term power, um, but reconcile its normative interests with its strategic objectives depends very much on whether it is capable of, of, of being, of, of, of defining in a very straightforward way what are the objectives, what are the incentives, what are the benchmarks by which we as, as a potential, I don't know, aid provider say, um, judge your behavior mm, and define the red lines. In that sense, as a when, would we even be willing to evoke 
the essential element clauses that you have in association agreements, that is to say, impose negative conditionality on a, on a given partner. Um, unfortunately, having followed or having participated in particular over the past two and a half years um, in, in um, a number of policy del deliberations related to the Eastern Partnership, I have to say that there is quite a fatigue, or I at least detected, and I would be interested to hear what Natalie thinks about it, but I detected quite a fatigue among a large number of policy circles in Brussels and at least some member states in what regards how dealing, in fact, um, as a European Union, as a collective, with our neighbors. I, I recall um, pretty vividly um, the run-up to the Eastern Partnership Summit in November 2007, um, talking to a number of, of influential um, colleagues in the External Action Service, all of who at the time said, you know what, we have reached a point where in fact we, we, we are no longer um, believing that any of this works and either these countries, these regimes do their homework or they should go to hell. Uh, of course, this was kind of informally um, said, but I think this discourse at the time depicted very clearly and very specifically the, the mood that to some extent I think is still pretty much apparent up until this very day. And it doesn't even contradict what Natalie said before, namely that people got it eventually. Uh, but still, um, one thing is people getting it, the other is the European Union having the capabilities and the political will, but the fourth is also, and I think this is very often forgotten in these conversations, the extent to which the European Union is also dependent on the local, the national and regional opportunity structures that present themselves in the surrounding regions. And unless, of course, you, you're dealing with a neighbor, whatever that means again, that is reform willing, that is ready to pursue costly and sometimes even painful reforms, that is willing to play ping pong. And unless, of course, you do have um, external actors engaged in the neighborhoods as such as well, that provide you with the relevant space and the room for maneuver, well, you can't really do that much. In particular, if you yourself are internally fragmented and divided. Can I, uh, first of all, or do you want to react to that? Yeah, or? I do, but you uh, I, 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 <laughs> I just have a follow-up question uh, to both of you, but then uh, we, can, we can continue. Um, is it, uh, isn't it that it's so difficult for the European Union to change its approach towards these issues? Uh, because it's its self-understanding that it's a kind of success story, a model, this normative claim is very strong and it has kind of built the EU's foreign identity. So it's, I think, isn't it so difficult to get beyond that? What, what is the common thing about Europe when you put that aside? And how can you manage to kind of use it still in a time where transactional partnerships and deals and, you know, um, uh, uh, politics or dip diplomacy and international politics are really are in the, in the process of change where these kind of normative claims are less regarded by the partners. I mean, Turkey is a good example. It's a candidate country, and Tayyip Erdogan just doesn't care. It's, and, and the EU doesn't have a lot of mechanisms to, to kind of counter this. So what, what, would be, what would be a common European policy if, if the normative aspect is taken aside? Do you want to say something? Or <laughs> well, see, uh, in fact, the question um, is actually mm. connected to what I was about to yeah. say. And when Tobias was speaking, uh, you know when you sort of look down there and you sort of have like a light bulb kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So you were kind of, uh, Tobias, you made me bing! <laughs> and the thing, I don't know if it's kind of uh, simple to, <laughs> to the rest of you. <laughs> but, but it kind of goes a little bit like that. I'm not sure whether it's an answer to the question, but at least it's a reformulation of the issue. Um, we're used to thinking at this normative thing mm, mm. Uh, in terms of certain goals, uh, like 
um, you know, promoting democracy or promoting human rights or promoting a strong civil society. I mean, basically, things happening in other countries. Uh, and uh, so that's the goal uh, in the normative mindset that we had. The means were our relationships. Mm -hmm. and, the, and we could do it through conditionality, through you know, softer, harder ways, more coercive ways, more socializing ways, but the relationship was the means, and the goal was all good things. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we're at a stage precisely because we're going through a transactional mm -hmm. uh, turn uh, in international relations, in a manner that is fundamentally against what the EU is. Not in terms of democracy and human rights and all good things, I don't just mean that, but I, 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 I'm talking about this, precisely this question of relationships and multilateralism, etc. So it seems to me that now the relationship itself has become the goal, and it does have a normative content to it. You know, Having good relations mm -hmm. can be interpreted as having uh, a normative content. Okay. Uh, and, and in a sense, then what you can say is in order to have a good relationship, um, or rather, uh, serving a good relationship, mm -hmm. so the means to the good relationship are the old good things of the past. Mm -hmm. But it's a complete flip around uh, of the two. The relationship becomes the goal. And we think that it's easier to have good relations with countries that are more or less uh, democratic and uh, not necessarily so, uh, <laughs> but it kind of helps. <laughs> but, but it's a complete change of mind, but I think it would be incorrect to basically say that what used to be in the past was normative and this is not. It's simply a different understanding of what are the norms that we prioritize because inevitably the way in which you formulate your norms is the product of an international context. So the reason, for instance, why the EU values, I think far more than it did in the past, things like relationships, if I think about Federica's mandate now coming to an end, for her a huge issue was building in relationships. Mm. Why does it help now? Because now at a time in which, for instance, uh, the multilateral rules-based order is being challenged, in which the United Nations is being challenged, now is the time to capitalize on those relationships, using them. So you went out and built you know, stronger relationships with different countries in Asia or Africa or, or you know, Latin America. And, and now it, it's the time to cash in. Because Trump is undermining the multilateral system, is that less normative? than trying to promote democracy, I think, you know, both, you can make the normative case for, for both. Uh, but if you want to build a strong relationship, as I said, you don't necessarily build it. Uh, it'd be nice to build it with all democratic countries, but I'm afraid that the basket would be a little bit small if you limit yourself uh, to stellar democracies. So it's, um, so to me, it's not, you know, I think that there's been a fairly lazy intellectual debate about, you know, it's about norms, it's about interests, I mean, bullshit. Huh? Uh, the point is that there are competing norms, uh, and one can, should have an honest conversation about these, you know, this competition. And how about the interests of single member states undermining <laughs> um, a common foreign policy stance or a common approach to the neighborhood? One quick remark, um, or follow-up remark on, on, on the point that you made previously and that was just made by, by Natalie, and then um, a, a quick um, answer to the one that you just raised. Um, I absolutely agree with what Natalie has, has just said. Um, if we That's because I was inspired by you. You don't really know what I was about to say, but... Um, <laughs> I, I take it for what it is. Um, <laughs> good point. Um, you see, this is a birthday celebration. Um, so you can't take us too seriously. And we already had a glass of Prosecco, I should say, um, before this event. Um, if we are to compare the, the state of relations um, between the European Union and at least some of, of the countries in its surrounding regions, 
um, to how things were in, say, 2002, 2001, where, of course, as was pointed out by Natalie, the geopolitical context was a very different one, then arguably I would say um, things have improved, um, at least, again, with respect to a few um, of those countries, um, as the European Union, via its neighborhood policy framework, managed to put in place a rather sophisticated, highly institutionalized architecture of dialoguing with each other on a very regular basis. Something that we, in fact, even take for granted nowadays, but which I think, in a world where dialogue is increasingly being questioned by a number of powerful and influential actors, um, this is quite an important feature that needs to be singled out and, and the EU praised for. Because that, in fact, means that you do not only exchange views and, and ideally even listen to each other, but that the European Union, talking about norms and inducting others into EU norms and mindsets and worldviews, whatever these are, in fact, I take it that these are the ones that are enshrined in the Lisbon Treaty, um, gives the European Union still an institutionalized mechanism to ideally at least contribute to socialization, uh, what, what the Europeanization literature calls European uh, uh, socialization, um, and, and network governance, if you wish. And I think that is a value added that the European Union has, as opposed to so many others, um, which do not look at, at dialoguing with each other um, favorably. Now, the member states question. The EU's foreign policy, um, foreign and security policy, if you wish, ever since it was launched, in fact, ever since the Maastricht Treaty entered into force in the early 90s, has been suffering from intra-EU fragmentation, if you wish. That is to say, member states having rather divergent foreign and security policy related interests and um, objectives um, and even diverge with respect to how these objectives um, should be pursued. As far as the neighborhood policy is concerned, arguably in particular uh, in, in the last two and a half years, um, this has become a major problem, much more I would say than, than in the past. Um, as nowadays you are faced with a situation and Natalie is also familiar with the, with the, the internal functioning and dynamics in, in the council, um, where member states less and less, sh shy away less and less from acting as spoilers, as veto players, um, and, and precluding the EU as a collective from taking meaningful decisions. I'm thinking to single out just one member state, for instance, um, of Hungary, that time and again over the past two and a half years um, has, has prevented the EU from adopting um, important, meaningful um, decisions, conclusions, declarations, um, if you wish. Um, the latest example of which is um, the attempt by, by um, the Council on, on the 9th of October um, to adopt uh, joint conclusions, I think it was, I'm condemning the Turkish invasion um, of uh, uh, northern Syria. Um, yet again, precisely because the Hungarians um, vetoed that. And if I'm not mistaken, that was even um, done in, 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 in the person of or through um, Hungary's um, permanent representative to the EU, which is poised, ironically, to become the next commissioner for enlargement <laughs> and <laughs> neighborhood. Um, a person that time and again, and I don't want to engage in, in bashing or single out individuals, um, that's not the point, but someone that in fact is, is a loyal um, confidant of, of, of a regime in Hungary that um, stands for the exact opposite of what is stipulated in, in the Lisbon Treaty and what all of us tended to believe, I think, at some point the European Union stands for. Um, and this is relatively likely, I believe, to become the next person to run DG NEAR, um, enlargement and, and well, neighborhood and enlargement negotiations. Um, I think that is a problem. And of course the sign, and I, I, I will, I will um, end on this note, the sign or the signal that is being transmitted 
um, by, by these member states that increasingly do not shy away or shy less and less shy away from um, acting as a, as a veto player and, and derail, in fact, um, um, fast decision making is, I think, um, not to be underestimated because, it, in fact, signals other member states that you can actually get away with it right. uh, without, exactly without being it. sanctioned. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to open the floor and take some of your questions. Um, yes, please. Saito? Yes, please. Do you need a mobile microphone? I think this one is not. <laughs> Sorry, we <you> don't. <laughs> Crisis, sorry, I didn't hear. Which crisis? Migration crisis. Uh, okay, okay. sorry. Yeah. And um, second question is I ask whether <coughs> the credibility of the European Union as so called uh, normal power is in so called neighbor countries are uh, in question. Uh, because in Christ EU, Thank you. Yes, please. So I um, thank you very much for those two comments, um, which also made me think and all kinds of things were going up in my head. I wanted to go back to what you were saying, Natalie, about how we need to also take into account other global players into this. And so the fact that the kind of conditions of possibility and spaces of possibility for the EU to be a geopolitical mm -hmm. actor in these surrounding regions also have to do with other actors, mm -hmm. whether it's the US or Russia. And I I appreciated the fact that you said that in the case of the US, it's not just Trump. The no. Trump moment mm. hopefully will pass. But what is interesting is that there is a very strong bipartisan push right now for what is being called the geopolitics of restraint, mm. right? So kind of withdrawal from interventionism. So I guess, you know, my question, because this is a question I keep asking myself as well, is if there is a possibility, considering this change in context, um, for the EU to exercise the sort of strategic sovereignty, strategic autonomy, you know, these terms that keep being bandied about, you know, which may include also a recalibration of relationships with NATO, for example. And I'm thinking of what is happening with Turkey right now, where NATO, you know, kind of the, the specter, you know, kind of conditioning any sort of response. That, but also taking into account that there are significant divergences among member states, actually very strong ones that might prevent this from coming to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Peter Rablik. I'm an economist working uh, at the Institute for International Economics in Vienna. Uh, thank you for very interesting comments and discussion. Uh, I would have a lot of uh, uh, observations, uh, additions, and so on. My uh, fundamental question would be that uh, in your implicit criticism of the neighborhood policy, I think that you were too mild. I wouldn't say that it was, I would even say that it was probably uh, a failure. This is not only my opinion, but also opinions of many others uh, who argue for a reform of the neighborhood policy already mm -hmm. for some time. Mm -hmm. So this is the first remark. The second remark is that uh, we should perhaps uh, more focus on the future. What, uh, we, what went wrong, we more or less know but what we should do in the future. And one of the recommendations of this previous uh, uh, reforms of the neighborhood policy uh, was that the uh, European Union should take more concern of the interest of so-called neighbors of neighbors. Mm -hmm. So this was one point. And this leads me uh, to a specific question uh, to both uh, panelists. What do you think about the chances of a kind of a reset uh, 
between relations of European Union, Russia, uh, in relations to Ukraine, to other uh, neighborhood countries. Mm -hmm. This is the first question. The second question is that uh, what do you think how to uh, somehow balance uh, uh, the role of other external factors? Mm -hmm. China was mentioned already. United States, I would say that uh, the United States played uh, a very important role in the neighborhood, also in the formulation of the EU neighborhood policy, and so on and so on. And last but not least, what do you think about the prospects of uh, neighborhood policy which would focus more on building some walls around European Union? Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of questions that are connected with each other. Um, one block was um, EU's relations with actors like Russia and, uh, uh, and, and, and how um, other global players are uh, influencing the EU's foreign and neighborhood policy. Um, and then the credibility problem of the EU and the impact of the migration crisis. Who, who would like to start? Okay. Okay. You're the boss. Okay. <laughs> I keep believing. I start believing that it's right here. So. <laughs> um, so on, uh, I link migration to credibility, uh, and I would answer the question actually by um, citing something that uh, Federica phoned me only a couple of weeks ago. Mogherini phoned me a couple of weeks ago, and so we were having a chat, and I asked, um, you know, over the last. Uh, five years, so looking back, as you know, she's uh, finishing in, or she hoped in two weeks, now it's going to be a month and a half, but anyway, she's finishing soon, uh, <laughs> her mandate. Um, I asked her, you know, what was the hardest moment? And of course, you know, there have been plenty uh, of very difficult moments uh, in the world, you know, from, from the election of Trump, uh, JCPOA, mm -hmm. and, you know, I could go down a very long list. And, uh, and she said to me, migration, the migration crisis. And I say, why you, the migration crisis? And she said, you cannot understand just how embarrassing <laughs> it was to go out to Asia, to Africa, to Latin America. And you, there, you were there wanting to talk about all sorts of issues. And every single person that I met would say to me as a first point, what are you doing? Yes. You're pathetic. Yes. You know? Here we in uh, Colombia, we have three million Venezuelans coming over. I mean, and you're just making a fuss uh, about, and, and just to literally said it was impossible to talk about anything, you know? Uh, it made my job impossible. Uh, so I really, really under, sort of think we've underestimated how. If a crisis it has been, it's been a major crisis uh, of credibility because of what it said about who we are. Mm -hmm. And what it said about who we are, not about not only to ourselves, but to the rest of the world that was, that was watching us. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make uh, is about this sort of US retreat, others <laughs> <laughs> sort of stepping in, and, and, and again, what this, what this says about um, us as Europeans. I think in some respects, one could say that, you know, it, it's not as if we're weaker than we were in the past. Uh, it is that our weakness is exposed because of that US retreat. So up until recently, we could kind of afford not to have a foreign policy because uh, someone else had it for us, and at times we disagreed with it, you know, like uh, when that someone else went and whatever invaded Iraq. Um, you know, for instance, at times we, we agreed with it, but on the whole, the bargain was one of a US uh, security guarantee over Europe, which of course is still formally there, uh, in return for the fact that we were part of that empire. Let me use that, that term. And now that empire is in retreat, uh, and we're not going anywhere. And others are filling that space. And, and I think it has, I think, you know, behind the conversation about autonomy, there is there is something there. I mean, it, it's this extremely painful process of growing up, uh, but it's an inevitable one. Uh, and, you know, to me, the question mark is not whether it's going to happen, but whether it's going to happen fast enough uh, for us to, you know, 
be ready when the real crisis comes. I mean, it hasn't, you know, really come and come and hopefully it won't, but, but who knows, you know. Um, and, and, and autonomy does not mean that, you know, the ambition is to become autarkic or to become protectionist. It's to become autonomous. And if you look at what autonomy means, it's uh, about the ability to live the self, yeah, so the self, the European self, to live by its own laws, uh, mm. national, European, international. I mean, that's the meaning of autonomy. Uh, and, and it takes, I mean, you know, to sort of take up an, an Iranian proverb, uh, because they mentioned this to me when they were talking about what we should do cons you know, concerning the JCPOA, which is very much about an issue of sovereignty. They said, you know, you've got to understand that if you want to swim, you've got to get wet. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's the point. We have to be willing to take the cost of getting, of swimming. Mm -hmm. And whether it is incurring the wrath of the United States, uh, whether it is uh, including an economic <laughs> wrath of the United States, uh, whether it means putting money in defense, whether, I mean, it can mean, mean a trillion different things. But ultimately, if we really do wake up to the reality that no one else is going to do it for us, and that if we don't do, if we don't do it, not only is there not going to be someone protecting us, but there are others, you know, Russia, China, stepping in. So there, there is no alternative. Um, and it's quite uncomfortable to say it, but again, I do think it is the responsibility of the political level to be, to be frank about it. Um, okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for the questions. Um, oh, this one is working. This one wasn't working either. Um, to, to pick up on the uh, question related to the migration crisis and how it has impacted upon the ENP, um, two points. Um, one, um, it has an impact, it has been having an impact on public opinion among electorates in the member states, um, a very negative one, as we all know, and that as such turn out to be rather constraining with respect to the appetite on the part of decision makers in Brussels and the member states alike um, to come up with bold um, foreign policy um, plans with respect to the neighborhood. And I think this is particularly a problem with respect to um, neighbors such as Tunisia and Morocco, both of which have been demanding time and again a much more lenient um, visa policy on the part of the European Union, a much more lenient um, mobility and partnership related approach on the part of the European Union. And de facto, um, this is more or less what they truly want um, from Europe, um, because obviously they are not interested in membership for the very reason that we all know, they simply cannot become members, and according to Article 49. And um, if the European Union really wanted to make a difference vis-à-vis -vis in particular North African countries, then it would be precisely in that particular way. But precisely in light of the experience of 2015, and to some extent how this resonated up until this very day, um, EU's hands are tied. Um, and it cannot be as generous as it has been vis-à-vis -vis the Moldovans, Georgians and, and the Ukrainians um, granting these countries um, visa liberalization. Um, so in that sense, um, migra the migration crisis up until this very day is having a very negative impact um, on the extent to which the European Union could make additional offers or provide incentives um, to neighbors, um, in particular in, in, in the southern neighborhood. Um, you mentioned um, the point, or you claim that I was way too um, positive um, about um, this, this whole um, EMP and the pursuit of it over the past 15 years. And again, my answer would be, well, by which standards um, do we come to that conclusion? What are our benchmarks? How do we measure success? How do we measure failures? Um, and as I said at the very beginning of my initial intervention, I think and I would really want to make a plea with respect to that particular point. We have to be very careful to not engage in that, in that EU bashing per se, as there are in fact policy fears and issue areas 
when the European Union does make a difference. And by the way, um, if I may say, um, the European Union doesn't have a monopoly on not being effective for foreign policy actors. Oh, yeah, it's a good, um, good, good company there. Exactly, <laughs> it's, it's a very good company. And it seems to me that all too often we look at the European Union um, through a prism whereby we apply um, criteria and standards and benchmarks which, which do not really do justice to the very nature of the European Union as a subject of international relations. It is not a state. Let's not forget that. It is simply um, a hybrid, sui generis actor that is drawing on supranationalized um, policies and at the same time has to put up with intergovernmentalism. And that, as such, of course, um, constrains its actions in, in the world. And again, even though I myself am, am a rather critical observer of, of, of the EU's role in, in the international system, um, I would say that compared to where we were 26 years ago when Maastricht entered into force, we witnessed quantum leaps, um, I think. Um, we have come a very long way, and yet, of course, we cannot comply with all the expectations that to some extent we have generated, we as a European Union, and which to some extent we, we can't really do much about, um, simply because recipient countries in our neighborhoods, in the, in the surrounding regions, do also have false expectations, um, period. Um, <laughs> Last point regarding the, 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 the reset um, of EU-Russia relations and, and this whole discussion about the neighbors of the neighbors. I think that is a, this is a very important point and it, it made me think. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm tempted to say up until this very day, the European Union has failed to put in place a Russia policy. It doesn't have one. Um, and that is a problem. Because, as was said before, this is one of those neighbors of the neighbors that simply doesn't go away. And uh, rather sooner than later, we should have a policy in place in order to come up with clear-cut responses as to um, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to the European Union. And in that sense, what happened in 2008 in Georgia, when um, uh, in, in August 2008, uh, the, the, the Russia-Georgia war erupted um, and, and occurred for five days um, and where the European Union did not really have a clear-cut response and did not sanction Russia, did in fact also um, provide an avenue for, for Russia then in 2014 to more or less test um, a similar thing in, in eastern Ukraine and, um, and, and Crimea. And that is a lesson that up until this very day we haven't learned, unfortunately. And yet, I would say, I think it is pretty remarkable that for almost five years now, well, five years, yes, in fact, um, time and again, member states, all member states managed to extend and renew the sanctions regime. In spite of the fact that on occasions, this alliance seemed to be fragile and member states uh, seemed to threaten uh, to leave this alliance, this coalition, this is remarkable. Um, and in that sense, the European Union is one of the few international actors, in fact, that has a very sophisticated system of restrictive measures vis-a-vis -vis Russia in place. Very last point on this. I recall um, the second half of 2014 when Russia demanded um, to be given a say over the association agreement with Ukraine. For quite some time, the European Union rejected that idea, saying, well, we are sovereign, we do not have to consult with anyone and, and coordinate with anyone whatever we do in our neighborhood. And yet, eventually, it, it established the Trilateral Commission um, in the context of which the trade or the impact of, of the DCFTA were to be discussed. Um, and that was an attempt by the European Union to bring in Russia um, to discuss probably one of the most important, by extension, foreign policy tools the EU has at its disposal. It was to no avail, but it was to no avail, not because the EU was not willing, but it was simply because Russia, time and again, up until December 14, came up with all sorts of unrealistic demands and requests that simply nobody, neither the Ukrainians nor the, um, um, the European Union, 
um, could comply with. So I'm just um, evoking this particular example in order to show that if pressed sufficiently strong, the European Union does react, is responsive, and is even, again, willing to engage in dialogue, even with um, an actor such as the Russian Federation, even though, of course, you do have, again, the situation where the member states constrain the Commission's room for maneuver, um, period. Thank you. I'll take one. Is this, there, there was one question. Is there another? Maybe two? No. OK, let's go for one. Yes, please. OK, well, uh, thank you both. Um, I was a bit surprised about the pessimism here, and I'm grateful to Tobias for also pointing out some positive uh, success stories, because my first question would be, what if there was no European neighborhood policy? But then I think we would have a worse state of affairs. Secondly, um, considering the new commission coming into place and also the next financial framework, and also the fact, for example, that the Eastern Partnership I wanted to ask you how do you see, considering that actually things m might be much worse the farther away we go from the EU, could it be that the EU may stop uh, punching above its weight and focus more on its neighborhood, invest more into its neighborhood, and how do you see the future uh, strategy for the Eastern Partnership in this sense? And I'll add a question, how will Brexit? <laughs> Happy. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, no, to the to the neighbourhood uh, question. Um, yes, I think you're absolutely right. And, and actually, I don't think that. I mean, certainly, uh, if I can speak for Tobias, I mean, the intention was precisely to point, uh, uh, not necessarily to the positives, but precisely as you put it, how much worse would things have been? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, perhaps actually one point of disagreement with Tobias on this is that, you know, Tobias had said, you know, we don't have a Russian policy. Well, actually, we, we have had a position which has, you know, had its yeah. coherence yeah. Uh, and that, as you say, has actually, we, we stuck with it for a number of years. And, you know, put it, putting it in your counterfactual sense, who knows what would have happened had it not been there? Mm -hmm. Maybe things mm -hmm. would be a lot worse than mm -hmm. what they are, you know? Maybe Russia would not have stopped with uh, the annexation of Crimea and the destabilization of Donbass and all of the other things that it's done. Maybe it would have done a lot more. Uh, we, just, we just don't know. So in terms of so what, what to do, I mean, as I said, I think we understand what we have to do. Uh, and and so to me, it's not really a question about developing a new strategy for the Eastern Partnership or for the Southern Neighbourhood or for God knows what in our surrounding regions. It is about doing it. So it is about continuing to invest in that resilience building, uh, continuing to invest in our integrated approach, continue to uh, sort of support participatory and not necessarily assume that we have to export our model because as Tobias was saying at the most this is a story about approximation uh, and if you follow uh, sort of the line of reasoning that I was highlighting earlier i.e. the fact of developing a foreign policy it is not even that um, so it is about continuing to do all of these things, but without the illusion that we have a magic wand to fix it, um, but that we have to keep on going at it. So to me, it's not so much, as I said, a question of kind of writing, which sounds a bit odd as someone that wrote a strategy, but I actually don't think that this is time for a strategy. Uh, I think I've kind of written this recently. I think this is Europe's just do it moment. Brexit. Brexit. <laughs> Brexit, I think, as a, I mean, okay, who knows what's, what's going to happen, uh, but actually I think that um, the EU has already um, internalized the cost of Brexit, uh, which was a reputational cost. I mean, the fact that for the first time we were not expanding, but we were shrinking. Uh, and so in a sense, you know, we kind of, we, we took that beating already. Uh, I think that now we're, uh, we as a 27, we're in an up phase. Uh, I think it's been quite remarkable that we've stuck together the way we are. I don't see that unity fraying over Brexit. Uh, I think that we are showing the world, beginning with the United Kingdom, 
how bloody costly it is <laughs> to actually uh, behave, uh, you know, the way they are. Um, so I, I think, you know, obviously it's very difficult to spin this in a positive way, but I think the negative bit we have already digested. Uh, the negative part for the UK is only just beginning. Mm. Yeah, I try to be brief, as I was told that we have to come to an end uh, rather sooner than later. Um, one or two points on, on the future of the Eastern Partnership. As I, as I said before, um, up until this very day, arguably, there is no appetite in Brussels and the majority of member states, the exception probably is Poland and, um, and supposedly Sweden, um, to engage in new ambitious um, cooperation, let alone integration schemes with any of the Eastern um, Partnership countries. Um, there is an Eastern Partnership fatigue, even I would say. Um, it's a little less um, articulated and, and pronounced these days um, than it was, say, two years ago. Um, but what is being discussed already for a little bit more than two years, two and a half years, I would say maybe even three years in the case of Ukraine, is um, to come up with an Eastern Partnership Plus, which in my view is yet again um, <coughs> old wine in, in new bottles. Um, over the past 15 years, if you wish, you had a number of moments where individual member states came up with these pluses ideas. That was the, um, in 2005, the idea to have a Barcelona Plus, these are the southern neighbors, and the Germans came up with an EMP Plus. Um, and now for the past uh, two years, the Poles keep repeating, supported by the Ukrainians, that there should be an EAP plus, all of which, in my view, just um, demonstrates the extent to which there is um, desperation um, in, in, in Brussels and in some of the member states to come up with some sort of meaningful initiative that could satisfy the demands of, of Eastern partners, which, of course, is an illusion given that Eastern partners themselves are not a, a homogeneous bunch of countries. De facto, we are talking about a framework um, that is a three plus one plus two framework. So you have Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine, all of which um, enjoy pretty sophisticated association agreements, as you know. Then you have Armenia, which since November 2017 has the SEPA, um, even though this is still under ratification. And then you have two outliers, Belarus and, and Azerbaijan, both of which we don't really know how to handle, right? Um, but what is being discussed as far as um, the three um, more supposedly more advanced Eastern partners, namely Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, in that order, in fact, is um, to abolish roaming fees. Wow, that's quite a, um, from a geopolitical perspective, um, um, a, a step forward. Um, then the Ukrainians in particular are demanding um, to establish a customs union with the European Union, which if you look at it from a macroeconomic perspective and from an external trade perspective is complete nonsensical. Um, it's, it's even more harmful to the Ukrainians um, than, than it would be beneficial. Um, the Ukrainians and by extension the Moldovans, they demand to be incorporated into the Schengen regime, something which up until now is, is a, is a no-brainer. Um, to most um, member states. And then you have the idea of um, extending the emerging energy and, and, and digital union respectively also to the three eastern partners, um, Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova. Um, something that in my view is equally problematic given that there is no experience up until now with respect to energy and digital um, these are two emerging archies. Um, there is no roadmap with respect to how this could be transposed to the eastern neighbors. Um, and in a nutshell, all of this basically means that 10 years after the EAP was launched, rather accidentally, one should say, um, there is still um, a lot of soul searching in Brussels with respect to how can we keep these countries engaged without offering them the membership perspective which de facto is truly what both the Ukrainians um, and the Moldovans and of course also the Georgians probably even more explicitly and loudly um, demand. So again, this brings me back to the initial point I made. Is this a means to an end or the end itself? But it is clear if, if as long as the European Union keeps time and again 
providing neighbors, be they in the east or the south, with breadcrumbs, um, sooner or later this will backfire and might even push some of these neighbors into the orbit of other external actors, some of which are just waiting for the opportunity um, to arise. And as far as Brexit is concerned, I'm not a fortune teller. Um, I will um, take a pass on that one. Who knows if it's really happening? Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Tobias. Um, it's been great. Um, and it's been great to celebrate with two friends. Um, thank you for coming to Vienna and sharing your knowledge, expertise, wisdom with us. Thank you all for joining our celebration. This was the last of our event series, A Brand New World, but I think we will come back with a new series quite soon. And this is not the end. <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is the beginning of a new era, so to say, uh, in terms of our institute as well. So thank you very much. Uh, safe trip back. For and happy birthday. Thank happy you. birthday. Thank you. <laughs>